thirds loss of what? The money they used to have and then the money that you have now. Or if you're unlucky enough to have Volkswagen shares, as some countries actually do, you also lost a sizable chunk of your money and wealth. So one would think with these and so many other examples uh, that the finance sector would be sort of greening itself just, uh, just to stay healthy. And we see that there's examples of that leading up to Paris and after Paris. But we also, I think we all concur that more could easily be done. And two people who definitely concur and uh, who have been quite vocal in this are Mr. Sony Kapoor, who leads the independent international think tank, uh, um, Redefine. And you're also an advisor to the governments of Great Britain and to Norway. You just came from a meeting with the Olje Fonden. Uh, you're also um, uh, one of the young leaders in the United Nations terms. And so many other things on your CV, I'm not even going to mention them all. Some of them are you hopefully going to come back to in your interventions. And Pabu Lund, as you know, he's the um, Minister for Financial Market, Finance Markets Minister, and the Minister for Consumer Affairs, Consument Minister. And my role is to simply sit back and relax while these two gentlemen discuss how we can make the green market greener. And I want to start by just, just to kickstart you, uh, Sony. Uh, when you came here, because you've been to Sweden several times, so when you come here, what, what impresses you in Sweden and also what do you see that could be probably improved on? Uh, in green terms or...? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, otherwise it would... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what's really interesting is, first and foremost, you have a fantastic finance market minister. Um, wow. And I think... <laughs> Uh, it's, it's hard to exceed that, particularly if you compare this to finance ministers in, in other countries, uh, which don't look quite so towards the future. They're stuck in the past. Uh, definitely have a few more gray hairs, which is not necessarily good in terms of the intergenerational issue. Um, and are definitely not so open-minded or actually even sort of more rooted in ethics and I guess. Uh, so so that's, that's the most fantastic thing. The second is, again, in terms of, uh, you know, you do have pension funds that I know you have complaints about, including investments in, uh, in um, BHP and elsewhere and also in Volkswagen, but compared to how bad some of your neighbors are, compared to how bad some of the others are, are relatively better. Uh, and you have banks like SEB that have been you know, on the cutting edge of uh, admittedly very little that is going on internationally. So I would say perhaps one-eyed in the land of the blind. Uh, that is the best I can say. One-eyed finance minister. Wait, you, when you were a parliamentarian for the Greens, you were quite critical about what the government was doing for the finance market, greening the finance market. Uh, uh, how about how's the situation now? Well, uh, we're we're trying to uh, make the ball roll faster, of course, and uh, it's always easier when you are involved in politics in, in areas where there actually is a movement from the start. So it's easier to just push the ball a little uh, faster than to try to, to push it when it's going the wrong way. Uh, and uh, on that perspective, it's really uh, I'm very optimistic working in financial markets because I see so much movement, so much happening all around the world and also in the Swedish markets. So uh, we're, we're really trying to encourage uh, the movement and to do our part, of course, in that. Uh, and I believe that, of course, uh, well, we believe in free markets, but we also believe that the free markets has to have some boundaries that we have to set up from, from politics. And of course, sustainability issues is uh, part of that. And uh, of course, we have to make sure that the financial markets uh, is in tune with what is needed in order to, to leave a world to our children and our grandchildren in the future. Uh, and uh, we also see that um, Perhaps this has been perceived previously as only a moral issue, uh, a moral uh, question. But now we see so much, as you pointed out as well, uh, so much information, so much uh, new uh, development that really shows that in order to make it in today's financial world, and especially in the financial world of tomorrow, and in order to actually provide benefits for, for shareholders and for investors and uh, for well, the general public, you have to be much more focused on, on sustainable development issues. And if you're not, you're going to have uh, very bad uh, revenues and, and uh, return on investments. So uh, I see that it's, uh, and, and of course, 
in that perspective, I feel that we're working uh, to, to decrease mythology that is really uh, too prevalent uh, uh, today. Uh, um, so many people in the financial sector has grown up with the perspective that you either have profits or you have considerations on sustainable development issues, and you can't have both. So if you put more perspective on, on sustainable development, you have to give back, uh, set back on, on, on uh, well, e the economy. And uh, this is really a mythology that we need to break down because, I mean, as you pointed out, the facts are there. So uh, and it's, it's um, I see that the world is really rapidly moving. And I think that for the financial actors, the most dangerous thing you can do in a, in a rapidly evolving world is to stand still and do as you've always done. That's really a bad rece recipe for, for providing profits. Uh, so I, that's what I try to convene to uh, all the, uh, the actors that I meet and uh, to, to bring that as a strong perspective from the Swedish government. Mr. Financial Sector, what is sort of the deal breaker, the most convincing argument? Well, uh, I think that uh, one of the most convincing arguments is, of course, showing the statistics. And uh, for example, if you've invested in, in low carbon assets uh, five years ago, uh, whether uh, as compared as uh, if you invested in high carbon assets, you can really show that you've got better profits, better uh, return on investment if you invested in, in low carbon assets. And of course, uh, when, when no other argument really uh, meets people, that's an argument that many people listen to. Uh, so, uh, and, and of course, th you also have the, the, al uh, the alternate perspective that if you don't care about sustainable development, you will have more risks in your investments. And, uh, it's it's well known from from uh, from research that uh, companies that uh, do uh, have a, have good work on on sustainable development and on uh, ESG issues actually also uh, tend to have better profits and better uh, better uh, markets and better uh, business uh, models, and so that's also a good way to actually uh, re reduce your risks, which is of course always in focus for for the financial sector, uh, and. There's more and more discussions about climate risk and how you can manage that and how you should uh, act in order to decrease our climate risks. So you both have the profits in one hand and you have the risks on the other hand, and these two lead to, to a lot of development, which I see is very positive. I don't know if you agree with that. Uh, yeah. Perhaps you had you started with a moral issue uh, from the start, and that's really been been we've worked quite hard from the green movement in trying to to persuade uh, the financial markets, for example, that we have to work with morals as well. Uh, hasn't been that successful all the time. And then we the climate risk, I think, has really started to sunk in. But I think that the third leg that we need is to look at profits and that actually green investments uh, is actually going to be more profitable in the future, and that in my view, hasn't really sunk in. I don't know if you agree with that. No, I mean, uh, part of the, thing, the problem is that morality is not scalable. I mean, you know, there, there'll always be a percentage of people who will be very moral, who will, at a great personal cost, do the right thing. And there'll always be a bigger set of people who will, who will do exactly the opposite. And there'll be many more in between who won't move much. So it is, at the end of the day, about uh, risk as well as profit. And the link with morality, I think, comes from uh, you know risk and profit also depend on what stance is taken by policymakers and regulators, right? I mean, um, and also when risk is realized. So, so one great big example of this is about three years back, I'd gone to the Norwegian Minister of Finance, just con you know, kind of to contrast the various uh, ministers of finance, uh, and I and I said, uh, hey, you know, um, I'd gone with the concern. I said it's time to sort of stress test the Norwegian economy to a great fall in oil prices or a rise in carbon price, um, and it was instantly rejected with some bizarre explanation about unrest in the Middle East guaranteeing that oil price would continue to stay above, I think, $80 or some number was used. Uh, and since then, I've calculated. So since about two and a half years back, when we suggested, you know. And, and kind of a lot of people agree that the Norwegian fund, which gets all its money from the sale of oil and gas in an economy that is already heavily exposed to oil and gas, sell off all its fossil fuel assets, it didn't. And now, uh, depending on how you measure it, it is $25 billion to $45 billion in red uh, in loss uh, compared to if it had actually sold those assets. So that graph that you showed actually in numbers, you know, and you know, 40 billion, 45 billion dollars is not to be laughed at by anybody. Uh, so it is, it is a real risk. And I think the basic thing what has happened, and technology has definitely played a part, right? So if we're honest, uh, 
there was a time when particularly, for example, in, you know, in fossil fuels versus green asset terms, there was actually a trade-off, that it was more expensive to use expensive solar cells and wind power, etc., and that there was a trade-off between you know, doing the right thing and profitability. Uh, but I think about, depending on how you measure it, five to ten years back, that threshold wa was crossed, particularly in warm, sunny countries. I mean, you know, solar cells in warm, sunny countries, wind turbines in windy countries, etc. And this is even before you take into account all the externalities of climate risk and everything else. So it's very clear. There's a sunset industry and there's a sunrise industry. And the financial sector, sadly, and I think you highlighted it best, is still stuck in making the best typewriter. Uh, in an economy that has moved way beyond that, right? And, and if you don't move on, uh, you can make the best, most efficient oil drilling machine. You can do that, and, and, and it's just going to actually uh, end up and slap you in the face in the end. And so that's what we're stuck with. So the risk part is really, really important. And the return part is, and linking it to development. So in many of the countries where the newest energy investments need to come through, this is not an ethical issue, this is not a climate change issue, this is a developmental issue. In India, where I grew up, I mean, 50% of the population has no access to electricity. And what they want is electricity. And frankly, like at the end of the day, people in small villages, they don't care where it comes from. And uh, I remember my dad used to be a senior bureaucrat, and it took two and a half or three years to get a landline. And at peak, if I remember correctly, India had one or two land telephone lines for every 100 units of family. And that was the peak it reached. And we never built the infrastructure for landlines, right? And then suddenly the mobile telephony revolution came. And now there's more than one mobile telephone for every head of population or something like that. And the same thing needs to happen on electricity. We didn't, and most African countries, India at least has got a grid that somehow you know, connects different parts of the country. But many of the rather sparsely populated African countries, somewhere in Latin America and Brazil, etc., there's parts of the country that absolutely are not connected to the grid. Many Indian villages, these people who don't have access, not connected to the grid. And you just have a technological leapfrog opportunity where that is the only way of getting them electricity. And at the same time, that Swedish pension funds, German pension funds, our insurance firms are struggling to generate even one or two percent rate of return by investing here within the EU. Uh, as an example, German pension funds, 96% of their investments are in Eurozone government bonds. And you don't need to be a financial genius to know that not only is this generating really poor returns, but this is also financially suicidal because it's connecting all of the risk to the massive political risk within the Eurozone, the fact that all countries are highly integrated, face the same risk factors of demographic decline, reaching close to the technological frontier, record levels of public and private debt, you know, political paralysis, etc. So instead of doing the right financial thing, which is to lock in high returns for low risk, most of our money, long-term investors, pension funds, insurance firms have locked in low returns for high exposure to risk. And at the same time, these developmental opportunities, these environmental opportunities in the rest of the world, which has a younger demographic, huge catch-up growth potential, has got very uh, relatively low levels of, politica, of, um, of private and public debt, and a reducing uh, you know, kind of political risk. So political risk used to be something that was a developing country risk. And I have an anecdote, which is out of my 10 classmates at the London School of Economics who went to work on political risk, which used to be in Africa, Latin America, Asia, five have moved to work on political risk in the OECD. Look at the United States, look at Donald Trump, look at the Euro crisis, look at refugees and Mrs. Merkel, right? So, so relative risk has shrunk, opportunities lie out there, and right now we're shooting ourselves in the foot by earning poor returns, getting everybody to work longer and longer to generate pension sustainability, threatening the viability of our insurance firms, earning really poor returns, and depriving millions of people of human development and basic energy education. It's just stupid. I certainly agree with that, and I think that uh, one of the reasons why, the, in, in my perspective, even though a lot is happening, and of course, I, I mean, the UNEP uh, inquiry that you were a part of is really hope, gives me great hope, and also the development with uh, the climate disclosure uh, group and uh, and uh, work on on uh, FSB as well, and uh, also G20 has highlighted these issues. So there's a lot of movement going on, but 
uh, I'm, I'm a bit frustrated sometimes about uh, how, how slow it go is going in, in other parts of the financial sector and in some, some private actors. And I believe that there are some reasons for that. One is, is of course, that you have uh, grown up with a view that, that uh, as I mentioned, you have to have make a choice between uh, environmental concerns and, and profitability. But the other, I think, is that of course, uh, when when the world changes, you have to sort of move out of your comfort zone and find new uh, ways, new ways of thinking and new markets th to invest in. And of course, uh, that is sometimes also quite hard if you've uh, worked a, a long uh, life in, in the financial sector to just uh, abandon what you believed in and start working in a new perspective, in new modes. And I believe that when it comes to energy investments, for example, that's really uh, one of the cases. I mean, uh, investments in energy has been into big uh, plants and it's been centralized and it's been large scale and it's, it's easy to make, uh, well to, to make a calculation about the, the uh, investment and the, the revenues. And now going into investing in, in lots of small scale uh, solar cells, for example, or small wind, wind parks or so, you have to find a new way of thinking and to perhaps find investment vehicles that is, is uh, working for that kind of market. And uh, of course it requires uh, somewhat of a new, a new way of thinking. And um, well, there's, uh, there's uh, a myth that the financial market is always investing in the most profitable uh, projects, uh, no matter what, and they when there's a profit to be found, they will always find it. Uh, but I see so many examples that there are so many profitable uh, investments that are not being done at the moment because of, well, old way thinking and uh, and uh, really a, a lag of, of uh, adaptation to a new a new environment that we're in and um, I believe that that of course the the uh, the ideas are are sinking in and is, is uh, I w when I got into to office and I started going out to banks and discussing these issues I had a, a view that I would be uh, laughed at or uh, ridiculed or or uh, at least people would say uh, this is not a part of our of our job this has nothing to do with us and I haven't really met that. I have rather met that there's a big interest in these issues. Uh, maybe not uh, an extreme amount of knowledge everywhere, but at least interest in these issues. So I think that's really a, a good start. But of course, uh, you have to go from just interest into also movement and starting to act in, in new ways. And there I see that th perhaps there's too much time lag and that uh, people are a bit hesitant and that uh, uh, there are so much strong incentives to find new investments and new, as you mentioned, I mean, investing in, in, uh, in uh, European markets, you, you get very low return on investment where there are so many opportunities that are, are both beneficial for uh, s sustainability issues but also for actually getting more return to your investors and still those markets aren't being really uh, developed. So... Um, and of course, we feel that there also is one of the answers to this. Is of, of course, is political answers. We have to make the prices right. We have to really make the economy move into green directions, and that of course will will help investors. But I also believe that there there are already uh, opportunities that are not being used, and that can make me quite frustrated sometimes. <laughs> Two direct suggestions for you. Yeah. Right? Um, so one is, I mean, I, I uh, often work with financial industry actors and the typical conversation, for example, when there's a discussion going on in, uh, in project financing uh, across the board, whether it's, you know, roads or whether it's actually even an energy project, um, somebody occasionally, and this doesn't always happen, so about half the time somebody says, oh, um, what's the assumption of carbon price? Uh, but half the time, there is no assumption. So you basically effectively take a carbon price of zero for a project with a 20, 30-year horizon. Uh, and then half the time when somebody mentions it, somebody picks up a round number, right? And it could be 10, it could be 20. If you're relatively progressive and care about your grandchildren, you'll say, well, let's do 30, 30 euros per ton or something like that, right? Or somebody looks at the price of the ETS, the emissions trading scheme, which I can't remember. The last time I looked at it was like three or four euros, right? Uh, so it's either a round number or ETS or no number. And for a 20, 30-year project, which may have including you know, a gas turbine, which may have huge risk exposure to if any fluctuation, this is beyond ridiculous, right? And so... Uh, one thing that you as policymakers can do, and you can do it even in Sweden, for example, already without having to wait for the rest of the EU, is to actually set a benchmark. Um, and what that does is it changes the burden of proof. So the burden of proof right now is on somebody to say, hey, we should 
take into account a carbon price in 20 or 30, and then somebody says, oh, well, why don't we pick a different number? But uh, instead of saying, you know, why pick a carbon price, it should be why not? And there should be some guideline. It could be 20, 30. It could be that you say um, that in order to tackle, you know, the Swedish commitments and the EU commitments, we expect that carbon price in 2020 will need to be 30 euros, 20 2025 will need to be 50 euros or something. But then that becomes the benchmark and it defines the discussion and it changes the relative benefits, cost benefit analysis of, of projects. So, so that's one way, one thing you can do. Another is to have mandatory environmental or carbon stress tests, uh, which basically, you know, your huge pension funds, you tell all of the APs what will happen to your portfolio. We want you to give us a number uh, or a range of numbers. What will happen to your portfolio if carbon price goes up to 30? if it goes up to 50, if it goes up to 70. And let's get that number, and then you say there might be one AP ha, you know, for, has a loss of 20%, another one has a loss of only 10%, and you're able to compare which one of them is more future-proof or future-oriented. You're able to, and they themselves, because uh, the way fiduciary responsibility works is, you know, if it's an unforeseeable risk, you know, the iceberg that hit Titanic, then, and everybody gets screwed like with Lehman, that, that's fine, right? I mean, there's safety in numbers. But if it's something you've identified, mm -hmm. you've put a number on, then, and if you fail to act on it, and it then materializes, then I think you have good cause to fire them, right? Uh, so, so, and then it becomes a personal risk and for them to act. So I think, I mean, these two things that you can already do in Sweden would actually already be helpful. And one last thing, since you're also the Minister for Consumer Affairs, uh, so I have an apartment in Berlin, and I've lived there part of the time for about 10 years, and about five or six years back, I think this was 2009, I went to buy a new washing machine. I mean, why it should be of interest to you, I don't know, but uh, let me tell you why. Um, and I was standing there, and you know, I went to a fancy engineering school, I've done mathematics, I consider myself to be reasonably smart, and I was standing there paralyzed for 10 minutes, trying to compare between two washing machines. There was one rated C, that was 350 euros, and there was one rated A on energy efficiency, that was 450 euros, right? And I know all the mathematics, the econometric models, and I just stood there, and I couldn't compare what criteria I should use to, to make my choice. And so the next day I called up the European Statistics Agency and I said, guys, you know, if it was possible, do you already collect enough data or is it easy to collect data to find out that when you go buy a car, a washing machine or anything that is energy intensive to give the average lifetime usage cost. So you don't have to compare apples and oranges, but you can compare apples with apples. And what you will find is that on average, you know, based on the average household use of the refrigerator or car or washing machine, and the average expected price of electricity, it is possible to show that in many cases, the upfront more expensive but better energy efficiency cost, uh, you know, appliance will have lower lifetime usage cost. And many more people will make that choice. And so this is a micro dimension which has macro implications because you know all Swedes deciding to buy A because it looks cheaper, the price label says it's cheaper over the lifetime you're gonna have it. And then you can do second order things, which links with the, with the other role as you know finance market minister, which is I called up all the big banks that reported the European Banking Authority and I said, guys, is it true uh, if I think that uh, between two people, one who buys, you know, Toyota Hybrid and another who buys an SUV, uh, even though the Toyota Hybrid is more expensive, over the lifetime it's cheaper, 1,000 euros cheaper. Is it fair to say that this guy is a slightly lower credit risk uh, because he has more financial capacity left? And they said, yeah. And I said, so would it then not be logical to say that when, since most people buy on credit, apart from in Germany, to say that when you offer credit condition, when you go buy a car or a washing machine or anything, that you offer a slightly lower interest rate on the items that have a lower lifetime usage cost. And they said, yes. So you get a double incentive for consumers. It's good for consumers. It's good for electricity, for energy efficiency. Plus, it is macro significant. And this is the kind of thing that changes financial institution behavior. So you have three things that I am going to you know, check back with you in three months, <laughs> whether you have implemented. Excellent. Yeah, well, uh, I like the suggestions, absolutely. And I think that we're, we're trying to work on all these three in, in different aspects. And uh, 
of course, uh, when it comes to life cycle costs, that uh, really depends on the energy pricing, of course. And uh, at the moment, we have extremely low uh, prices on electricity in the Swedish market, mainly due to that we have uh, succeeded quite well in, in introducing renewable energy into the market, and that's really pressured the, the prices. Uh, so, uh, of course, what what price you assume for, for energy prices in the future is, of course, uh, quite uh, determining there. But I think that... Um, one thing that you don't do enough as a consumer is really hedge the risk uh, for price development. I mean, we've, we've had the price spikes in, in the energy markets in Sweden that's been really uh, dramatic. And of course, if you ins invest in a, in a low energy uh, appliance, that's really uh, going to decrease, decrease your risks in the future. And um, I think that uh, that's also uh, a reason why people are starting to invest in solar energy, for example, on their rooftops. Sometimes it's really hard, especially with the low energy prices we have right now, to, to really see that it is a uh, good investment uh, from a financial standpoint at the moment. But of course, you hedge the risk that you, you know what your price will be for decades ahead, which is, of course, a great value. And uh, I think that that's really also something that I'm missing in the financial markets, more of a view that you actually can hedge the risk uh, when it comes to carbon pricing, for example. I mean, just by decreasing uh, your investment in, in high carbon assets and in, in uh, well, markets that are really uh, well have a high uh, high carbon emission and uh, high risk, uh, you can really get the same uh, revenue, but decrease your climate risk dramatically. And this, of course, also leads to to more sound investments and to a greener future for us all. And uh, in in my view, it's really really uh, strange that you don't take these kinds of decisions just from from a security perspective that you want to decrease your risks in the future. But I mean. Uh, is is quite obvious. I'm I'm, uh, I'm from the natural science side uh, in my education, and of course it's well known that if we are to stay below two degrees centigrade, which is uh, decided in Paris, and we have to should aim for 1.5 degrees. I mean, that means that you, you really you can't use all the fossil fuels that we know of. I mean, 75 percent or so has to stay in the ground, and of course, this we value the the fossil fuel companies as if. They, all the oil, oil, all the coal, all the gas will be used, and of course, this is a mismatch. That is, of course, a risk. I mean, either you're you're betting that the world won't adapt to climate change and won't really uh, have a strong policy response, uh, and then you will have the negative effects of climate change instead. Uh, that will really strike business opportunities really hard in the future, or you you admit that we have to find a response. For example, carbon pricing that make this happen, that, that leaves us with 75% of the fossil fuels staying in the ground. And then, of course, you have to re-evaluate uh, the, the fossil fuel companies uh, on the markets. And right now, we're doing kind of both. Uh, so it's really uh, the, the worst policy of all, <laughs> in my view. So uh, I find it really strange that, um, of course, uh, you can see this as a lack of, of uh, trust in, in the political lances and that you're really trying to say that we, uh, the world won't respond to climate change. But after Paris, I think that that issue should really be, uh, be closed. I mean, uh, we know that uh, we, we all the world has to respond to climate change and that will, of course, affect pricing. We know that about 12% of carbon emissions is priced already uh, through taxes or through emission trading systems. We know that China is, is working hard and will, uh, I think it's 2017 that they will have a, a carbon uh, pricing. And, of course, many other markets will follow. So I believe that... Now we have a map in the, in the world where we have lots of white spaces where there are no carbon pricing, but in just uh, a few years' time we will have a completely different map. And of course, carbon emissions will cost, and and that that the financial analysts can't see this happening is really uh, is, is quite strange in my view. And uh, when there are so many easy answers to really decrease this kind of risk taking, uh, it, it's really strange that it, it doesn't happen already. Uh, Speaking of carbon stress tests, I think that's really an inspirational idea and I think that's something that we should really work on. And we have uh, asked the, the FSA, the Financial Inspectorate of Sweden, to, to look at um, financial stability connected to, to climate and uh, from, from two perspectives. One, if, if we don't do anything and, and we have a four degree warmer world, how will that affect the financial stability in Sweden? I mean, we know that this will affect the productivity uh, dramatically and that will, of course, have an effect on our financial system. Uh, so that they will look into that and uh, they will also look into if we have a strong policy response, if we have a carbon price that is reasonable, how will that affect the financial stability? For example, all the investments that have been made into fossil fuel companies. Uh, I mean, the AP funds of Sweden, they have, have done quite a good job, but they're still quite heavily 
invested into f fossil uh, fuels. Uh, so how will that affect the uh, possibilities of having good pensions in the future for uh, us when we retire? Um, and for the financial system as a whole in Sweden. And I think that this knowledge, th they will present this report in, in uh, just a few weeks' time. And this knowledge will help us in developing this kind of stress test and really try to, to see what how the economy will respond to different uh, alternatives when it comes to climate change. And uh, so I think that this is really something that we will uh, try to work on much harder in the future. I mean, just to uh, take this a little bit further and, and for a second wearing the hat of the financial sector, right? I mean, my, my compensation if I'm in the financial sector is annual. Uh, my bonus calculation is annual. And for the most part, I know either I'm going to, you know, change bank or change financial institution or, you know, change job or retire or change function within the bank within maybe two or three years. I mean, there's very few functions where people remain for more than two or three years. And for me to consider the consequences of my action, you know, assuming basically I'm an asshole, uh, or, 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 or I'm like most other people, okay? So, so let's just say, I mean, most people just don't have the bandwidth, okay? You need to go pick up your kids from the kindergarten, etc. People don't usually end up doing things that they're not like narrowly supposed to do. And that has to be the assumption to get anything at scale. Um, and to consider consequence in the long term, and this is goes, goes back to policymaker action. Uh, so tomorrow I'm doing a lecture to the executive board of the central bank, but that's about you know monetary policy and euro crisis. But I just wanted to borrow an example from that. So if you look at um, you know uh, pricing of bonds, which is 30, 40 percent of the portfolios of all the pension funds, and you know like banks have massive amounts and everybody has massive amounts. You own loads of them without knowing. The whole pricing is done off the yield curve, and the yield curve is nothing but the expectation of future interest rates. So, you know, what is the Swedish interest rate expected to be in one year time, in five years time, in 10 years time, in 20, 30 years time? And then if the Swedish government borrows for 20 years, then you see what the interest rate is, and you know, that's the curve. So the thing about yield curves is, that if you actually take into account these yield curves, about 60 to 70 trillion dollars of financial securities are priced on the basis of these yield curves. And these yield curves actually are pretty meaningless. They're except for, they're supposed to be the best guess for future interest rate. And the one thing you know from the yield curve, and the record is very clear on this, is that five years from now, the interest rate will be anything apart from what the yield curve is saying today, what the interest rate will be from time. Like, totally, completely inaccurate, right? I mean, history is really clear on that. But it goes back to, you know, the, it's, it's both a human need and a mathematical need in the way that these securities are priced and financial analysts make their modeling and calculations. They need to plug a number. They need an anchor, right? I mean, all of us like anchors, be it your girlfriend or you know, your home or your job or whatever anchor. And everybody wants an anchor. And this is where policymakers and this guidance, where because they are right now not assuming anything. And if you say that you know, we want or we will try on a best effort basis as the Swedish government or as the EU, that carbon price will be 30 or 50 or something, then that's what they will use. And that instantly changes the dynamics, and that makes it part of their day job, even if they're, they know they're not going to stay in the job for more than one or two years. Then they will plug this into the present financial models. So it's something, I mean, I'm happy to talk about it bilaterally, but it's something that can has an, an, have an enormous difference. And it's something that you can learn the lesson exactly from central banks, which is all about managing expectations of future interest rates, even though most people know that they will fail. But it's the best guess that people with different mindsets can make. Well, uh, um, I agree that uh, it would be uh, preferable, of course, to have long-term uh, planning and to, to know what uh, at least a, a, a minimum level of, of carbon price in the future. Of course, uh, well, with the emission trading system, we, uh, we uh, don't set the price. We just set the, the targets, and uh, then the market will, will set the price. Uh, so uh, it's really hard to, to uh, of course, you could have some sort of, of minimum pricing, and uh, that has been suggested and been discussed in the Swedish uh, policy debate, at least. But uh, I think that um, uh, what surprises me is that when I am abroad and, and discussing carbon pricing, uh, 
when I mentioned that Sweden has a price of 120 euros per ton of carbon, and and we have one of the best working economies in the European Union and one of the highest growth rates, and it really it shows no sign that this is detrimental to our economic development. Uh, people are still convinced that this isn't possible. I mean, uh, they're, they're really convinced that this will have, it must have, because uh, that's what my, my, my textbook says. Uh, so it's really uh, surprising to me that, that uh, it really hasn't sunk in that it's possible to have a carbon pricing that really uh, makes your economy more innovative and uh, makes it possible to find the new solutions rather than being stuck in the old. Uh, so, so just a bit cheeky for a second. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I remember when I was working on the euro crisis, uh, you know, your, your ex-finance uh, minister Anders Borg came a number of times to Brussels and used Sweden's failed example of financial transaction taxes and said, look, you know, we are a well-governed country, we tried it, it failed, you guys just shouldn't even go there, right? And, and he did a pretty good, as he does, I mean, he's very good at that, right? Uh, he did a pretty good marketing job which played no insignificant role in the fact that the European Union and the Eurozone still hasn't agreed on a financial transaction tax. May I suggest, uh, cheekily, that you assume the role of, you know, th that same efficient marketing role, and you either put the same intensity and the same effort and the same resources, or go beyond that, and go tell and preach to the world, look, 120 euros carbon price, Sweden 4% growth rate. Uh, yes, we have problems and housing bubbles and all of that, but, but we, we don't go there. <laughs> oh, no, let's stay out there. I think that, that would be a good sensible thing. And, you know, politically, I yeah. mean, since, since you define yourself in opposition to, to the moderates, you know, uh, it may be a nice, fun thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I agree with that. And of course, I think it's, it's quite erroneous to, to compare the, uh, the tax that we had in Sweden in the 80s to the transaction tax that has been discussed. It's really two different things. Um, but I, I agree with you on the, on the long term and, and having to targets that really point out the direction for all the financial actors. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy that Sweden, we've uh, adopted a target for a, a goal for the financial sector as a whole in the uh, budget bill uh, that was also passed through, through, gov uh, through Parliament, that the financial system should uh, deliver uh, on sustainable development. Uh, the, the goal of the financial system should also be to, to contribute to a sustainable development uh, on a societal scale. And this really is, is a sign that this is something that is not just a, a temporary fluctuation, it's something that will stay for a long time. And of course, if we are to reach the national environmental targets and the uh, global environmental targets, the sustainable development goals, for example, uh, we really have to, to see to it that the financial system contributes in that perspective. And um, of course, it was, was quite heavily debated in, in Parliament as well, but, but uh, it was passed through. So it's really uh, now uh, a goal that is, is uh, really uh, from, from the whole of Sweden. And I think that this really points out that, for example, there will be no uh, decreased incentives for, for uh, investors or for financial actors to, to uh, move uh, towards green investments, but rather we only will increase the incentives over time. So uh, I think that this should be perceived as a strong, strong um, well, uh, guidance for, for the actors that th this is development that will be pursued in, in the coming years and decades in Sweden. So I think that... Um, this is really uh, uh, important to uh, to have long term targets and, and goals. Um, but I'd like to to ask you. Uh, we we talked about the stock markets and uh, the development there, and also about the bond markets. There is hopeful development in green bonds, for example. But on the credit markets, uh, I see that th perhaps this is an area where there is most slow movement and there's too little happening. And uh, we asked the, the FSA as well uh, to look into the credit guidelines and, and how banks are working with uh, environmental and, and social uh, sustainability issues when they give credits to the different projects. And well, they l looked at nine different banks in Sweden and they saw that all of them are, are working in s some way or the other, uh, quite different quality on, on how they look at these issues, but all, all of them are working with it. But the transparency is really lacking. There's, there's no way to, to get information about uh, what, what is the development, what will happen, uh, will they decrease their uh, emissions from, from credit or will they increase it? So, uh, and, and uh, uh, do, do you see any development internationally or in other markets that uh, there is work uh, being done on, on credit markets as well, uh, from a green perspective? Um, well, I mean, it's it's 
partly um, linked to the earlier discussion we had, which was, you know, sort of it's, it's a collective action problem issue. And, and those institutions that are sort of ahead of the curve, and, and one really important point you made earlier, which I just want to highlight in case it was missed, was that um, the institutions that have been, the financial institutions that have been more forward-looking, investing in green energy and looking at sustainability, et cetera, um, it is actually often a proxy for better management and future orientation and better risk awareness. So some of the additional financial returns that you spoke about came actually from uh, you know, less exposure to fossil fuels, which have fallen, and more exposure to some of the booming you know, sunrise industries. But a large part of the, of the better performance came in areas that were totally unrelated to the environment. And that goes back to you know, the management of a company which is not looking at making the best typewriter anymore, but is looking at you know, new market development, is aware of the risk if you continue to make typewriters, etc. cetera. Uh, it's a proxy for being more open, forward-looking, future-oriented, and risk aware. It's a proxy for good management. Uh, and so in that sense, you know, so what I've seen is bits and pieces, examples of financial institutions that are thinking of this in purely self-interested terms and are using this because they're aware of this and, and, and as a risk mitigation tool, as, as, an, as a proxy for you know, demonstrating and signaling that their management is superior. And those, for those, there is a better transparency, et cetera. But for those who don't view this as a competitive advantage, uh, who are not as far down the curve, there hasn't been much systematic. But going back to environmental or carbon stress tests, uh, you can stress test for a number of things. I mean, it doesn't just have to be carbon, right? I mean, it can be resource efficiency stress test. What is uh, your exposure to, you know, spikes in the prices of certain minerals which China stops exporting or any, any of those. And I think that doing that process internally, because in many of these institutions, it's not because they're being difficult. It's that they actually just don't even have the internal processes. But if there is a guideline from the stock market or from the FSA or from you know, the, the finance ministry, et cetera, an expectation to report, and what you need to report, you start measuring. And what you need to start measuring, you then actually have a pipeline of transparency and information. So I think that's, that's a reasonable, good starting point. Um, one more suggestion, yeah. going back to that. Right. Uh, so I, I remember when we, when we spoke in Almadal two years back, uh, we were sort of complaining a little bit about the financial sector. And you know, I've been a big critic of, uh, of the financial sector. And we discussed it was possibly too big, uh, commanded too many resources, et cetera. Now, I just wanted to update you in public that I've changed my mind on that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so the f I think the financial sector, the problem, and this is a global issue, that we, the problem is we have too small a financial sector. And where it exists, uh, there need to be more people who abandon PhDs in physics and whatever and move to the financial sector. And let me explain why, right? I mean, if you're not convinced, you can throw tomatoes at me after. Uh, but uh, so, so as an example, so there's supposed to be 70 to 80 trillion dollars of long-term capital, pension funds, insurance firms, sovereign wealth funds, et cetera, right? If you actually look at the number of employees of organizations that supposedly own this capital, and I might be exaggerating a tiny bit, but not much, this is less than the number of employees of credit agricole, just one single French bank, right? So I think what we have at a global aggregate level is a huge misallocation of human capital in the financial sector, too many people working in banks, too many people working to generate credit of the kind that inflates housing price, et cetera, and too few people in uh, working for institutions where actually you get long-term capital of the kind that, you know, in the old-fashioned way, we expect these guys to fund infrastructure, we guys expect these guys to fund energy projects, et cetera. So, for example, you know, pensions, Denmark, I think they have like 12 people or something, or maybe 20 staff of 20 people. And what I find is that most of these funds, including many of the APs, not only do they not have the human capacity to go seek out the small, profitable, and development and environment friendly uh, solar projects in small, medium sized Indian cities or, or you know, villages, the kind of disaggregated. But they, so they don't have the human capacity for that at all, right? But they don't even have the human capacity to engage with people who have the human capacity. I mean, it's so constrained. 
And for example, when I was working in Brussels, for every 20 to 30, uh, and Hannah, my old colleague, knows this, who is working with me. That's Hannah. Um, um, that for every 20 to 30 uh, sell side uh, lobbies from banks, hedge funds, and private equity firms that came to see me to lobby, there was one person who came from those people who we normally think of as providers of long-term capital, you know, the Swedish pension funds, the insurance firms, the sovereign wealth funds. There's a huge asymmetry in human capacity. So if we expect, as we do, for the green transition to be funded and for development, you know, SDGs, et cetera, primarily be funded by these actors, we need to build more human capacity. We need a huge reallocation away from banks that are funding standardized you know, housing projects across the board, which doesn't actually need that much human intelligence, to people and institutions. It may be pooled institutions, maybe. you know. I mean, I know that you know, Sweden's got a liberal tradition, and uh, you don't necessarily believe in industrial policy in the same way some other countries do. Uh, but this is a collective action problem, and it's not about government subsidy. You don't need subsidy, but you need to put heads together and say, guys, okay, we need you to collectively put some people, put some heads together so they have people who can actually seek out these opportunities and then you can then access this and that gives you a competitive advantage. It diversifies your risk and it improves your return. And at the same time, it gives uh, Sweden the potential to generate uh, more in the form of service jobs, highly productive jobs, which are actually good for Sweden and good for the world. And you get to be the new financial sector once we in the UK leave. You know, you uh, you can take over from London. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, I can agree with you that. Uh, I mean, when you look at uh, the, the people in the financial sector are working with with uh, reporting or with other parts, huge amount of, of personnel. But when you look at the people looking into uh, sustainability issues and and climate risk. There's almost no one, so it's really, really a, a, a very uh, low uh, sector. Well, there's not, not not much investment being done there in in, in uh, information, but I think that that's one way to solve it. Uh, another way is, of course, to make information more readily accessible. So it's it's uh, to to uh, increase transparency, to increase disclosure, so that it's easier to get the information. And of course from um, well, institutional investors, I mean, they should have this uh, capacity. I mean, they have so much capital. But for us as, as small investors and consumers, uh, being consumer Minister of Consumer Affairs as well, I think it's really, really important that we also increase the, the information that is being left to us when we are to make uh, investment decisions that can have really long-term uh, effects on our, our economy. And um, I mean, we know that so many people want to to invest with a moral standpoint. They want to uh, not just be retired, but they want to have a planet to be retired on as well. Uh, so that's uh, to have that combination is quite good in, in many people's eyes. Uh, but then, of course, you also uh, there is more and more awareness about the risks in in uh, not taking into account uh, sustainability issues. And when people look at uh, BP spilling oil in the in the Gulf of Mexico, and that really decreases their profits dramatically, and Volkswagen. Uh, is another example. Uh, of course, people want to to decrease these kind of risks, and and today we don't have the information that we need in order to make these informed decisions. So that's something that we're looking into in in different ways. Uh, one is to try to cooperate with the financial actors. So we've had roundtable discussions, for example, on on the carbon footprinting, uh, which sh think should be a standard, uh, and that also th there should be a comparability, so that you use the same methods, so that you don't uh, compare apples and, and oranges. Uh, and I. I think there's a positive development there, so I think that there will be a standard uh, that comes from from the sector itself. Um, but then also, uh, uh, we we've asked a, a committee to look at the uh, the information that we get as as investors uh, today and how that can be improved so that we can make better informed decisions uh, about our, our finances in the future. So that's something that will come uh, in the end of uh, uh, in the beginning of June. Uh, the committee will have a proposals on how to improve. From FS from the FSA. Yeah, oh that's okay. right. Yeah, so they're both. So in the this, pipeline, this right? is about uh, well, uh, how to get access to more better information. Right. And uh, of course, there is a, is a development when uh, when uh, non-financial uh, companies are now uh, being asked to to disclose and to to have more non-financial information. For example, sustainability reporting. So we have new legislation on the way. That at least two thousand companies in in Sweden, the the um, biggest ones, uh, will have to report on on the, for example, carbon emissions and. 
and the climate effects. And that, of course, will also improve the information that is given to us and will also help institutional investors uh, make the right decisions in the future, I think. So that's something that we've been working very, very hard on. And I hope that this, for example, with the, the uh, Climate Disclosure Task Force uh, on the European level should also be a possibility uh, to, to uh, give much more uh, information and knowledge about these issues. I think that... Mark Carney's uh, speech on, on the tragedy of the horizon uh, was really an eye opener for many people when it comes to c comes to climate risk and, and that we actually this is uh, has not been perceived as one of the major risks previously but uh, now and in into the future we really have to perceive it as one of the the biggest risks that we have to handle from the financial sector and of course in order to handle it we need information. Um, so I think that this really is is uh, one of the the uh, crucial uh, things to work on to to uh, increase disclosure and comparability between uh, different uh, options. And I mean, coming back to consumer affairs, when when we buy a car on the Swedish market, you get a, a tag that says that this car consumes uh, X grams of carbon dioxide per kilometer we drive, and that's mandatory. Uh, so we have a way to make an informed choice. But when we invest often much more money into an investment fund, for example, or into a, a pension fund, we don't have that kind of information. And to me, that's kind of illogical. Uh, so uh, we should have that information also when we make perhaps our biggest uh, investments uh, as consumers as well. No, I, I totally agree. Uh, but but the, just to go back to my previous point, I mean, information and disclosure get you to a certain point, but we need to go beyond that. And this goes back to what I was saying about the size of the financial sector. So. Um, for example, you know, uh, in India tried a, a, a approach which was interesting and which which maybe where the Swedish Ministry of Finance can play a coordination role. And they had a three-way joint venture between the State Bank of India, which has eighty thousand branches. Uh, I think it's the largest, most branched uh, bank in the world. Uh, the Ministry of Finance of India and the Sovereign Wealth Fund of the State of Oman. And so what you had was three actors with complementary skills. So the State Bank of India had loads of local knowledge, but no long-term capital, because it only had you know, retail savings. Uh, you had the Oman Sovereign Wealth Fund, which knew nothing about India. Uh, right. And you had the Ministry of Finance, which was there as a broker and to sort of offer some sort of you know, political risk guarantee, essentially, by being present. And putting them together was really interesting. So similarly, I mean, you know, if you have AP funds acting together, maybe, you know, in partnership with CEDA and others, which go and talk to or you, you call up, you know, your counterpart in the Indian finance ministry and say, hey, guys, you know, we're interested in looking at opportunities that are here. Uh, but can we work together as a partnership? It is possible to set up these joint ventures. And that's a shortcut to actually having to build this human capacity. Uh, but if you build this human capacity, what I've done is, so I've taken a set of projects, green infrastructure projects from Latin America, from Asia, from Africa, and I've sort of put, together, put them together in a pool. And I go and I talk to uh, many of the investment committees, including a couple of the APs, and I say, guys, would you like to buy one or two percent of this well-diversified portfolio of you know, green energy assets? And everybody wants to jump on it. The problem is no such portfolio exists. It only exists in my head. Uh, and it, it goes back to you know, that first mover issue that somebody needs to. And individually, none of the funds have got the human capacity or the incentive. Because typically, it takes like, you know, a few years for this pipeline to be put together. So, but if there were to be a Swedish initiative, not only would you get the advantage for the AP funds acting together and diversifying risk, but you might also be able to sell these services, get the Dutch and the Norwegians and some others who are lagging behind. Because really, I mean, the financial case is very clear. Most people agree. They just don't have the human capacity. Well, I agree with that. But I think that, that um, as I said in, 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 in the beginning, I think that there's a lot of positive movements uh, going on. And, uh, of course, um, well, knowing that the, the time is, is really uh, short uh, in order to have a response, for example, to climate change, we know that we have to really start shifting in the world in, in a quite very rapid, um, almost revolutionary way in order to, to actually make it to uh, at least uh, be staying under two degrees centigrade. Of course, sometimes it can be quite frustrating to to see uh, well the uh, that there's so much uh, lagging behind uh, from financial actors, but I think that 
uh, sometimes you just have to like look at it as as the catch-up effect. So uh, you shake the bottle and you shake the bottle and you shake the bottle, and uh, eventually it all happens at at once. And I I hope I'm really hopeful that the financial sector is really approaching that point where it's actually so much uh, convincing evidence that uh, there is so much more to be won to to change your views and to find new investments that it's perceived as more risky to stay in the old uh, in the old way of thinking. And of course uh, we we believe that the politics has really really strong uh, well responsibility to to make that happen but i also uh, you you said so many kind words to me in the beginning and i would like to give that back and i think that you've also done a very very good job from from redefine and from from the civil society as a whole in highlighting this issue and uh, of course in sweden we have fair finance guide for example and uh, really done a very good job and at, at highlighting these issues and, and giving more information uh, and we also had uh, for example the the Church of Sweden has done a very good job in showing that you don't have to to uh, choose between uh, revenue and and uh, sustainability. You actually can have both. So uh, these kind of positive examples is really really crucial in order to to make it happen much more. So uh, excellent job. <laughs> <laughs> My assistant tweeted me and she said that just the minute you talked about you know fossil fuels and change in policy. There was a big movement. The prices of BP and Shell fell mm. massively. <laughs> 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 we'll try to do what we can. <laughs> Started with the kind words from Sony to Pear and ended up with the kind words from Pear to Sony. And in between, I think all of us got so much fruit for thought and so much action that we actually believe is going to happen from the Swedish government and that Sony is going to push in all your meetings here this week in Stockholm and in your meetings with governments around the world. Now, my colleagues, they gave me 29 questions to put to you. I narrowed them down to 12 and in actual fact we covered all of the 29 and some others as well and I didn't have to say a word so I'm, I'm very <laughs> grateful. Sony you have by now because at Forest we like to give trees in forest to all our speakers and for by now you have a small forest on your own down there in, in, in Kenya <laughs> and I'd like to also give you two books in Swedish, in English actually, The Carbon Trading in a Paris Agreement. Car carbon trading is, is crucial I think to push the movement faster, uh, and harnessing okay. company climate action beyond Paris. We just left Paris, and this is now how to get company climate action. Susan Duck. And <laughs> welcome. And Paris, this is more uh, valuable than you think, natural economy familiar and interested, because wow. it's actually... <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Because it's actually signed by one of the authors, my Whoa. dear colleague. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you ever so much. Thank you both. Thank you very Thank much. You very much.